If you have one good, you can follow me. Otherwise, you're going to be in a little bit of a trouble. The basic proposition is in the front of your outline. I'm not going to dig too deep because we only have about, as you know, 50 minutes before we go into prayer time. The myth that man's will is free to do anything he wants is not biblical. The myth that man's will is free to do anything that he wants is not biblical. So where is this idea coming from? What is the common retort among humanity in its own self-assessment? One is that man is basically good. You, you actually need to know that this is an underlying presuppositional framework that is unchallenged by almost everybody in the world. You won't go to anybody's school. You won't go to anyone's institution. You won't be part of any organization where they basically um, are touting man's fundamental goodness and they not assert two things, that man by nature is basically good. That is the basic assumption of our secular world system. That is not a biblical worldview. It is not a biblical worldview to say the pe to people that by nature you are, are good. Um, it's not right to say to human beings that by nature you're right with God. But we, we might be inclined to say that because we're much more culturally driven than we are biblically driven. But a biblical Christian is to be armed to actually give a biblical worldview, particularly in opportunities where there is a misrepresentation of the nature of God or a misrepresentation of the nature of man. So the world can be divided into two major uh themes, a man-centered view of life and a God-centered view of life. These are the two juxtapositions that dominate almost all presuppositional views about life. And you can kind of imagine that if mankind does actually believe that he is basically good, then you can also believe that man believes that man can basically do whatever he wants to do. That assumption only follows. If the reality is, is that man is intrinsically and qualitatively good so that the fundamental drive of his, his being, his query, his, his, uh, his, uh, his pursuit in life, is only really goodness, then eventually what he's going to be able to do is achieve the good that he believes he has the capacity to do. I'm priming you um, for where we are today. And that is the assumption that mankind has the right and the ability and the power to become whatever he wants to become. So I'm leading you to show you that the subject matter of man's free will is not the way we used to think it many decades ago when we didn't make a direct correlation between the mere theoretical arguments. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you guys go way back with me when we would argue against Arminianism over against Calvinism or Pelagianism over against Augustinianism, which were historic roots in the church where the early patristic fathers debated what does the Bible teach about the basic qualities of humanity. And, and the two streams of thought would be well, the Bible says that there is none good, so that there is a real deficiency in the human makeup at the psychological and at the spiritual and therefore at the social level. That's what the Bible would say. Then other theologians would say, no, man is not totally bad. He still has some qualities about him that are fundamentally good, like he will help the old lady across the street if she needs it. Or if you see, if he sees somebody in duress, he might seek to rescue them. We see acts of uh, the milk of human kindness working everywhere in the world. And so you'll hear that kind of what is called humanistic observation of humanity. And what you're looking at are people viewing the world from two lenses, from what God says, 
versus what human beings say. So again, you see an individual who has enough uh, philanthropic care to see somebody struggling on the streets and he or she or they go over and they give them some food and they give them some clothing and they they help them out in a situation where those people are in somewhat of a dire strait. And you and I go, that was good. And 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 we would be presupposing to be right at a certain level, at the level of an act, but not at the level of motive. Because while a person can do an act that is defined by us empirically, objectively as good, it may be that from the level of their motive, God sees something in their action that in God's mind is a gross transgression against his will. Is that possible? All right, so what I'm doing is helping you understand how quickly you and I judge according to the appearance rather than righteous judgment. This is John's Gospel, chapter 724. I just want to milk your thought. And the reason why I know I have to do this is because we have been so pervasively influenced by so many optics and so many events and so many arguments and so many things that you might have a hard time trying to convince people that biblically the condition of the heart of mankind before God is that it is evil and wicked continually notwithstanding all of the altruistic things you may see him do in the human race. So we uh, read the language of Jesus in Matthew chapter 15. I'll just start right there in Matthew 15, start at verse five. You've heard the language before, but I want you to see what Jesus says. And I want to pick up on where we are. But again, I'm nurturing your thoughts. Here's what Jesus would say as he reminds his disciples of the of the condition of, of mankind. He uh, he's teaching um, in Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to start at verse uh, verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth, they come forth from the what? And they defile the man. And here's the language for out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts false witnesses and blasphemes. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defile not a man. Jesus says in the gospel of Mark in that same language, all manner of evil. And then Jeremiah reminds us in Jeremiah chapter 17, nine, you've heard it before, that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked who can know it? Now, notice what he does with that last line. He says, you and I can't know the heart. The heart is like a deep well. And in it are all kinds of malicious and selfish motives, drives, and aspirations. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately what? Right, so that's an indictment by God concerning the nature of our hearts, right? And then again, you remember Genesis 6, verse 5. Here it is. I want you to see a few verses so we can work these things through. You remember God destroyed the earth in the beginning of time with the flood, did he? All right, so now most of your scholars do not believe in the flood. Now, it's convenient not to believe in the flood because if you don't believe in a the flood, then you don't have to believe in a God that judges. And you don't have to believe in a God that judges sin. And therefore, you don't have to believe in the assessment that God made that predicated the flood. So here's the assessment. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Now, how many of you have never seen these verses before? It's important for you to know. Good, good. I'm helping you understand that God has given an analysis of the attitude and conduct of mankind all throughout Scripture. Here's another one, Psalm 14. Psalm 14, of course, this is going to be Romans chapter 3, but you can start at Psalm 14, maybe around verse 1 or 2, um, so we can see. The fool has said there is no God. 
That's a fundamental predisposition of the world today. Would you agree with that? Now, God calls them foolish. Now, notice what it says. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. This is God's assessment of humanity. There is none that doeth good. So now that is what is called an absolute statement. So here's what God says about humanity. There is none that doeth good. You guys believe your Bible? All right. So if you believe your Bible, now what you're stuck with is an assessment on God's part about the behavior and attitude of humanity that runs completely counter to the narrative of humanity. Because according to Proverbs, every man will proclaim his own goodness. So why we started the series on the uh, myth of man's free will having the ability to do anything he wants is not biblical, is to work through what I consider a main thread of deception that has led humanity to where we are today, to where we think we can actually redefine ourselves even at the scientific and genetic level. And I'm sharing with you the only reason we have gotten as far we are as we have as human beings thinking that we have the right to change our body parts and re to redefine our own gender and redefine our own sexuality is because we have not been checked at the door of the false assumption that man is basically good. You guys got that? And, and Christians have done a horrible job too because most Christians acquiesce to the Pelagian Arminian view that man is basically good. And when you use that language, you're actually leaving the door open for the rebellion of humanity on the faulty presupposition that he is good when God says he is not. Y'all follow what I'm saying? All right, so it's important to notice. Now, what we did in our outline on uh, Friday was we asserted uh, as Jesus taught in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 34, that mankind is not a free moral agent able to do what he or she wants to do um, as if they uh, are not in control or controlled by some outside or exterior power. Mankind, Jesus says, if ye is a practicer of sin, whosoever commits sin is the what of sin? Slave. Right. And that literally is the word slave, doulos, slave of sin. And we raised the question. So my first proposition was lost humanity is a slave. That means he's in, in bondage. Is that not right? He's in bondage to another. He is in bondage to another. Now, again, that smacks totally different than what the secular world would say. So we read Ephesians chapter two, verse one, to give a corollary on this. And notice what it says in Ephesians two, one. And you <laughs> that used to be dead, who were in who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse two. Where in time past you walk according to the course of this world, that is the systems of this world, the ways of this world, the views of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now does what? Work in the children of what? Disobedience. So now, either we are children of obedience or we're children of disobedience. Is that true? Now what Paul said here is, Children of disobedience are governed by a spiritual system. And we know that system is satanic. And so what we say is that if you're not a child of God, you're not just free to do whatever you want to do. You're in control by a spiritual power that is undetected on your part. And it's actually driving you to do its own bidding. We were in that way before. I was part of the children of disobedience, doing exactly like the world did, thinking like the world, acting like the world, behaving like the world. We saw this on Friday, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Listen to it. 
I'm going to milk you, and then we're going to go into our propositions. I hope I have enough time to do a little Q&A, but we certainly will do it Friday. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Now, the servant of the Lord, in this context, he's the pastor, teacher, must not strive. That means when you're engaging people with biblical truth and you're trying to share with them what biblical truth says, you will get opposition from them. And notice what it says. But be gentle unto all men, and you must be capable of teaching. And in that, you need to be patient. Now look at verse 25. In meekness, maintaining a sense of control over yourself so that as you share with other people, it's not about you. And this is critically important to persuading people if God would help. Instructing those that do what? Oppose themselves. Today, right now, you have a major battle going on in your world around, again, the issue of gender. This is huge. Matt Walsh just made a movie called What is a Woman? Every Christian should see it because the fact that we are now contemplating the inability to define humanity within the simple context of empirical science means that we have lost our way really, really bad. And the Christian should not think that this is merely a kind of cerebral exercise where you get to choose to believe it or not. There are major losses to be had if our culture ultimately is permeated by this view. You, there are major losses to be had if you and I don't know that we cannot just stand back and let it become policy everywhere because people are losing their job. They're being kicked out of colleges and universities. They're being punished and people like myself will go to jail. If we simply oppose what we know is unscientific, illogical, irrational, anti-historical, anti-social, and anti-biblical, we know this. So I'm bringing up the subject matter of what I consider the most difficult concept to understand, and that is the faculty of the will. Because the faculty of the will is at the heart of your identity in many ways, and is certainly at the grounds of your expression as a human being, meaning it is the faculty of choice making. And where you and I will just sit back and go, well, people have the freedom to choose good or evil, right and wrong. People have the power to do or not do good or do right or do wrong. No, you do, you are not looking carefully at the scenario to see that God has made an assessment about that. So now, you guys know we have been exercising our senses over the last couple of years around postmodernism, right? So this is what I've taught you a couple of years ago. I'm going to put it at you again. How you perceive a thing does not equal the reality of the thing you perceive. Your perception does not correspond to reality. It might be possible that your perception actually facilitates the reality that exists. But your perception is not itself reality. And it's a good possibility that we frequently walk in misperceptions of reality. And humanity is being trained to misperceive reality as a natural pathological quality. How do we know? Because the Bible tells us that the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. First John chapter five, verse 19. And what that means is mankind is constantly being lied to. And he's constantly believing the lie, is he not? Right. So now if that's true, if we're being constantly lied to. And we're constantly believing the lie. Is it possible that we can be free in our volition to make choices right or wrong or good or bad? without some kind of predetermining, preconditioned, some kind of pre-influential powers driving our decision-making? It's impossible 
that our wills would be free living in a vacuum or a void so that our choices are made without some kind of preconditioned prejudices. Does that make some sense? It's impossible. It's impossible. And in fact, sociology would prove that. In my Monday show, I talked about this last night, what is called predictable programming. Does anybody know anything about predictable programming? You ought to, because you grew up in it. Every movie you ever watched was designed to predict a programmable outcome in your life. Every movie you watched, every program you watched was designed to shape the way you thought and elicit outcomes on your part, emotionally, psychologically, or otherwise. And because we do know within the realm of sociology that big tech has already proven that it can sway people to the tune of tens of millions to vote in a particular direction because of the hypersuggestivity of the videos and the presentations and the news flashes and the images that your mind is receiving 27, 24 seven a day. Am I making some sense? So here's my argument that you don't have a volitional faculty of choice making that is impervious to influence. In fact, the very opposite is true. You and I are influenced one way or the other, by good or by evil, by the flesh or by the spirit, to make choices that we think are right, that could be absolutely diametrically uh, contrary to the truth. Does that make some sense? Right, so now what that means is that the idea of men's will being free is not true. So our first proposition, lost man is a slave. The second one is he is only really free, humanity, to sin. Um, that's a simple proposition, but I want you to be able to begin to work with it. He's only free to sin in this sense. <clears throat> you do have a will. It is free, but it's only free to operate in a particular direction with a particular bent for a particular outcome because of the condition of your nature. Your volition is never free from your nature. Does that make some sense? Well, this is why we can write books again about pathological behavior of animals because we know their nature is to do certain things when you put them in certain environments and under certain conditions, they are predictable. And so are human beings. You put human beings in a certain condition and you can expect them to act out certain ways. That means their will is not free. So, all right, so let me continue to drill down into that on a just a philosophical level. Let's presuppose that it was true. It's not true, not even close to true for anybody thinking for five minutes that we live in a void or a vacuum and that every choice that we make is the consequence of an unprovoked and uh, unpredetermined, non-conditional act. Well, we're just acting freely. Then no suggestion come, no ideas, no appeals, no temptations. We just saw a thing and we decided to do it without thought, right? We just decided to do it without thought. If we had the ability to act like that, there would be no capacity on anybody's part to predict anything about what you would do at any time. I'm going to say it again because I want you to wake up. If you and I were operating in a vacuum, in a void, where every choice we made had absolutely no predetermining conditional factors, no epigenetic, bio, neurological, psychological, social, environmental trends, driving it as a set of prejudices. We are just free to act. Just, I don't know, I just did it. If all of our volitions were operating in the space of that kind of freedom, no one would be able to predict anything about you anytime. Did I make some sense? Did I make some sense? So in the judicial system, they understand pathology. They understand that if you raise a child up in a certain environment under certain conditions, this is how that child's going to act. They also understand that if a child grows up in a home where there's a mother and father with certain pathological patterns, that epigenetically, those traits are going to carry over to that child. These are all predictable qualities because we are not free. 
Am I making some sense? And I, I'm building that argument so that you can know that when people talk about, I have a free will, I can choose to do whatever I want to, whenever I want to. You can know that they just picked it up from somewhere, didn't even think it through at all. At all. None of us are ever that free. So what I also stated was, if you and I were that free, God would never, ever be able to lie down any kind of prophetic truth about tomorrow and it'd be certain. Did y'all get what I just stated? Like, like if you and I are operating so free of preconditioned, seen and unseen, deep, profound realities in the cosmos that have the ability to shape and move and, and affect us at the subconscious level. But we're just wide open and nobody knows at any given time what anybody going to do, not even God. Now that's freedom, isn't it? Isn't that freedom? Like God goes, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> I didn't create it. I'm, 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 I'm waiting to see what they're going to do too. And therefore I can't prophesy a thing because when I prophesy, I am telling you, I know you're going to act this way and you cannot do otherwise. Am I making some sense? All right. So I laid that out in your, in your outline because as a Christian, you don't get to go around saying that people are free to exercise the power of good or evil at their whim because now you are challenging the sovereignty of God. You're challenging God's sovereignty. If man is free, if devils are free, God is not sovereign. Do you understand that? Like now, if God is sovereign and according to the Bible, he's in control of everything down to the subatomic particles. Then God sees it all before it happens because it is reality with him. And there's nothing that you and I are doing that's extricated from the sovereignty of his omniscience and his decree. That's true, right? Okay. So it's important for you and I to get that. So mankind is only free to sin. John 8, 44. This is what we we're dealing with before. I want to calm down because I want you guys to just recover this teaching just as an, an axiom for you to be able to deal with what's going on in our culture today, which is an attack on the Imago Day. The attack on the Imago Day has come from the history of mankind being able to get a pass on the assumption that he is basically good and that the will is free. Both of them are a lie. Jesus says you are of your father, the devil, right? And the lust of your father you will do. See the word lust? That is volition. That's drive. That's the grounds of your choice making. Like what we will argue here in a minute is every choice you and I make is built on our lust. Do y'all know that? Like every choice that you make is built on your lust. You never do anything freely. You're always compelled to your choices. Your choices are always an outcome, not a ground of an act. Your choice is always predicated upon a proposition or an idea or a set of ideas or a set of influences driving you in a direction to make a choice. Always. If you're hungry, you are now being driven by a set of internal mechanisms that's advising your lust to eat. You're not just eating out of a vacuum. You know, I think I want to eat. I ain't hungry. I just want to eat. No, you want to eat because you're hungry. You understand? Right. So this is James chapter one, verse 13. You've heard it before, but I want to lay these out a couple, two or three more arguments. Notice what it says. In, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Stay here. Go back. I need to just make sure Jesus' teaching is heard. Sorry, John 8, 44. You've heard it. You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he did not abide in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. And what Jesus said to the rulers is, like the devil lies, you lie. And like the devil murders, you murder, because both of those are driven by lust. To be at the center of control. Does that make some sense? 
Lying and murder are lusts to be at the center of control. Think about it. Every time you lie, you are trying to maintain control. And murder is just the absurd outcome of maintaining that control. That's what murder is. Murder is you saying, I'm going to have it my way if I have to kill everybody to do it. That is volition rooted in lust. James chapter 1 verse 13. Listen to it. This is James 1 13. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted, therefore he tempts no man. Verse 14, here it is. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own what? Now this is the mechanism that explains all of our choices. Everybody's choice is predicated upon this. Did you know that? The psychologists talk about the fundamental aspiration of living on the part of every creature being rooted in lust. And they have tested human beings for hundreds of years by putting them in the most despicable situations human beings could be put in and saw how human beings change in their nature from a nice, kind, altruistic person to a rabid, 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 self-desperate individual willing to kill somebody else for food. Do you understand that? So we can de deceive ourselves into thinking we're nice until the pressure's on us. Then all of a sudden, James 1, 14's kicking in. Isn't that right? Now, how powerful is our almighty will then? I have the willpower not to do any harm to you if it came down to you and me living. And the only thing that could secure my survival is if I kill you and eat you. Well, you can ask the folk that have been on trips around the world and it was only a handful of them left what they did to the other human beings who became vulnerable to them being the only way that they could survive. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. Right, it's very important for us to know that we are liars and we deceive ourselves about our basic goodness. It is not true. Does that make sense? Right. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and then enticed. Verse 15. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why you and I find human beings to be so disappointing under pressure, right? We find human beings to be so disappointing under pressure. And conversely, they find us to be disappointing under pressure. Now, the only reason they find us disappointing is because we bought into the lie that some of us are exceptions to the rule, that we are basically good. No, we are not. Now, what we need is the intervening sovereignty of God to restrain all of us from being as bad as we could be if it weren't for the grace of God. Now, am I making some sense? Right. Now, again, the reason I'm restoring this doctrine to you and me is because you have some award winning Academy theatrical actors on the planet who deny God, who deny man's basic depravity, and they go around advocating for everything we know is contrary to God's will, and they swear they're good people. Are you guys hearing me? They're swearing they're good people. You got the advocates for the transgender community. They didn't build a whole system on how to identify somebody that doesn't hold that view. And they call themselves rescuers. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? You've got it in universities. These are the almost all of these are sociologists. And because they are buying into critical race theory and social justice and and protecting transgender people, the thing they do is run out in front of anybody that even wants to raise the question, what is a biological woman? And they begin to act out and argue and debate with you as if you don't even have the right to ask the question. Now, what they're doing is putting on a pretended righteousness, a pretended goodness. 
and they get inflamed and they fall out whenever you challenge them and push them on their logic. And go, oh, okay, this is that whole group of people that are getting PhDs to pretend to be good people when in reality they are evil people. Are you guys hearing what I'm getting at? Right. Now, the reason, again, that I'm bringing the subject matter up to us is because I actually see an unbroken correlation between the fundamental flaw of man being basically good, the assumption that his will is free, and all of these other very express evils that are perpetuating our, themselves in our world, including in the medical industry. Are you guys hearing me? Everything that's going on for me has major correlative connections to the overall objective of a wicked world system that wants to deny the biblical worldview and the biblical God of his authoritative assessment of our problem. I don't see a disconnection between transgenderism and the COVID scam. I see a, a direct correlation between all of them. I do. And, and because Christians don't, they're hoodwinked and blinded in many spots when it comes to the relentless working of what the Bible says. And the dragon, that old serpent, the devil called Satan, deceiveth the whole world. Now we don't believe God there because if we did, we'd understand that we are dealing with all kinds of systems of lies that are designed to move us towards an annihilation of a biblical worldview and biblical humanity into transhumanism. Why are we sitting here asking the question about the woman? It's because we are on the precipice of moving into a post-human era. Am I making sense, children of God? It's very important to get that. So when you're talking with your Christian friends and they're trying to be nice, please understand that they're being trapped again. They're being led to abandon a biblical worldview. So in your outline, I want to start making a uh, way through some ideas so that you can put your hands on more scripture. And then we'll pick this up more fully Friday. Point number two is called predictable programming. The predictability of sinful pathology is proof of bondage. Would you agree with that? The predictability of sinful pathology is proof of bondage. God raised the question in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. You've heard it before. Here it is again. Here's the question he raises. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? What's the answer? No. Are the leopard his spots? What's the answer? No. Then sh may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Is that possible? No. Listen to what he says. So when you're dealing with rhetorical answers within a package, the rhetorical answer is the same. It does not change at the end of the proposition. The proposition and its rhetoric is designed to lead you to the conclusion. All right, so can the Ethiopian change his skin? No. Right. Now, what are we asking here? We're asking something about the nature of that, 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 that person. You can't change his nature. Right. And then we're going, or the leopard is spots. Here he, again is another nature query. You can't change the leper's spots. It's in his DNA. Can you take somebody that's only accustomed to do evil and expect them to just wake up one day and start doing good? The answer is no. And that's what Jesus meant in John chapter 8, 44, when he says you are of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you will do. It's extremely important for you and I to understand that. This is so critically important and it's predictable. Evil men will do evil. That's what your Bible clearly lays out. I have um, uh, examples of three characters. I'm just going to use one or two right now to show you what I'm talking about. The predictability of sinful pathology is a proof of bondage. The first one that I'm going to uh, use will be, um, it will be Nebuchadnezzar. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 4. If you recall in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. I'm going to start at verse 4 of Daniel 4 and read a little bit about it. And, and remember, Daniel interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and told Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree. And that tree is getting ready to get cut down. Y'all remember that? He told Neb, look, Neb, you are that tree. And that tree is going to be cut down. And by the way, 
You're going to be like an animal. You're going to be groveling in the ground for seven years. God gave him a specific prophetic timetable of being completely devastated. Y'all remember that? Right. He says, now this is going to happen for seven years. And guess what Daniel said? Now I'm suggesting, Neb, that you cut off your sin and righteousness now and you're good to go. I want to show you how depraved we are by nature. The prophecy comes to tell you this is what you're going to do in one year. In the pride of your arrogance, you're going to walk throughout your palace and you're going to say to the heavens, you made all this with your own hand. That's what the prophecy is saying. And at that moment that you say that, Neb, all hell is going to break loose and you're going to turn into an animal. You're going to be that way for seven years. You're going to lose your mind. Now, you got an opportunity right now, Neb, according to your free will. To turn. That's exactly what Daniel said, didn't he? Cut off your sins and righteousness. Do you guys remember? I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Verse 5. I saw in my dream, which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Verse 6. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, they might that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Verse 7. Then came in the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation. Verse 8. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom the spirit of the holy gods is. And before him, I told a dream. Verse 9. O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, no secret troubles you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have and the interpretation thereof. Give me verse 11. Verse 11. Uh, the tree, uh, Daniel is explaining to him, the tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Let's keep walking. The leaves thereof were fair and the fruit thereof much and it was meat for all. The beast of the field had shadows under it. And fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bowls thereof, and all the flesh was fed of it. Let's keep walking. And I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said, hew down the tree and cut off the branches, shake off the leaves, scatter the fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Who is this tree, you guys? It's Nebuchadnezzar. What's getting ready to happen to this tree? That's right. Verse 16. Let's keep walking. I want to show you guys the inevitability of predictable prophecy that could not otherwise be the case. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth, even with the band of iron and brass and tender grass and field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let its portion be with the beasts of with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times pass over seven times meaning how long? seven years stop right there now Daniel is going to tell Neb he's the man whom God is going to allow his heart to go mad for seven years right is that true is it going to happen can I ask you another question could it have otherwise not happened It could not have not happened because it was shown. Okay? Now I want you to walk through because what Daniel is going to do is show you that even when the conditional out is given, it doesn't change the outcome because God's purpose is to show that the pride of man must be broken in order for God to get glory. Now notice what it does. Verse 17. Let's keep walking. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, demand of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high, what? Rules in the kingdom of men. Stop right there. There is your, what we call chief operating principle. Your chief organizing principle. What is the goal on God's part? That the living may know that God is sovereign over the hearts of men. You got that? So that's why he's got to let Nebuchadnezzar go crazy. In order for Neb to be the one to tell the world the most high God rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he wants to, whenever he wants to. 
And if you try to fight against God, you'll lose your mind. This is called the sovereignty of God over man's free will. Y'all got that? Here it is. Verse 18. This dream I Nebuchadnezzar had now thou, o, now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as wise men of the kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but you are, for the spirits of the holy God is in you. Verse 19, let's walk it through. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour. His thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not your dream or the interpretation thereof trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, the dream be to them that hate you. That's his desire. I wish this was on your enemies. The reality is, this is God's decree against you. Remember, God is sovereign. Is he sovereign? Yes. So man's free will never, ever thwarts God's sovereignty. Would you agree with that? Yes. This is why I say that you cannot say that man is basically good and has the ability to do whatever he wants to, because that would mitigate God's sovereignty. Now, notice what he says. Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, the dream be to them, I'm good. The tree that you saw which grew was strong, was heights reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, verse 21, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof, what they're doing, this is called narrative theology, reiterating the same story, you guys know it. Verse 22, it is thou, O king, you are grown and become strong for your greatness is grown and it reaches unto heaven and your dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven, saying, hew the tree down, destroy it, leave the stump of the root thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron, brass, tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let its portion be with the beast of the field. So till seven times pass over it. Seven years, this man going to walk around like a fool. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High. So Mark, we have the decree of the Most High, do we not? Right. Now, if God speaks... Can his purposes be changed? His decree cannot be altered. Whatsoever goes out of his mouth will come to pass. That's Isaiah 46, 10 and other passages. This means that God is sovereign. Right. Now watch. This is, uh, there you go. That, uh, go back to verse 24. Let me, uh, let me speak that out. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king, Verse 25, that they shall drive you from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you to eat grass as oxen and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over you until you know that the most high rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomsoever he wills. So this is a battle between God and Nebuchadnezzar. See, so Nebuchadnezzar somehow began to lose his mind like the human race that I'm dealing with. See, the human race that I'm dealing with is losing its sense of its own arrogance over against the sovereignty of God right now, too. And that's what Neb did. Neb secretly, privately started boasting in all that he built and all that he had established. And he was willing to steal God's glory and not give God the honor for it, even though Daniel has been with him. Mishio, Hananiah, and Azariah since the beginning of Neb's reign. And God's been blessing him through those Hebrew boys. And Neb now wants to rise up and tell the whole world he built this with his own hands. That's where we are in our nation. That's where we are in our own country. This is why you don't, you don't even expect to hear our leaders give God glory anymore. See how far we've gone? And it wasn't that way 70 years ago. Our leaders gave God glory and honor way more than they do today. Notice what it says in verse 26. And where is your commandment to leave the stump in the trees of the tree roots? Thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that, you shall have known that the heavens do rule. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Now, you see what Daniel does? Daniel says, Neb, if you start acting right right now, it's possible that this judgment may not come on you. Y'all got that? 
That's a conditional clause given by the prophet. That's not what God said. Do you understand that? And that's why Neb paid Daniel no attention, uh, attention because Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have a free will to do whatever he wants to do. His will is in bondage like all of our wills are in bondage to our lust and the lust of our father we will do unless God intervenes. Now, this is what goes on. I, I got two other accounts to share with you. Not today, though. Verse 28. All this came to pass upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 29. At the end of 12 months, this was a year after Neb, after Daniel gave him the vision. So like for a whole year, Neb had an opportunity to hear that little caveat that Daniel had given. Change your ways, boy. Just stop acting the fool. Start giving God glory. Start going to church. Pick up your hymn book. Right? When you breathe in, say hallelujah. When you breathe out, say praise the Lord. And count and, and give God thanks for all the riches and wealth. Because God has made you a big tree, boy. You are the head of what is called the golden cup. Babylon was the epitome of glory. The epitome of glory. God made Babylon the epitome of glory. And that Neb was the representative thereof. Twelve months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Now watch this. The king spake and said, is not this? America <laughs> that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. See it? Now you see how ugly it gets in the context of the sovereignty of God and God giving him patience to show the arrogance of his heart. Now, here's what I want to say to you. If you were in Neb's place, you'd do the same thing. You and I wouldn't be any different than Neb. You and I get a little leaf off the Babylonian tree and we go to clowning. We don't have anywhere near the proportion of wealth that Neb have and we still act the fool. We get we buy a little hoopty and we want to act like we run the world. We get a raise on the job, 50 cent raise, and we think we king of glory. That's how foolish we are. Right? We're no different than them. No different than them. Verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, see it? There fell a voice from heaven saying, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from you. Could Neb's free will overcome God's sovereign decree to determine that Nebuchadnezzar would be used by God to show the world that God rules in the kingdoms of men? See, it wasn't going to happen because no man has a power in their freedom of will to thwart God's purposes. Um, I could give you several others. You could read for yourself the whole chapter of Isaiah chapter 10 with the Assyrian king. God lays out the same thing with the Assyrian king. He said, I'm using Assyria as a battle axe against my own children, Israel. But then around verse 11 or 12, he says, but the Assyrians don't think that way. They're going to rise up and overpass and they're going to try to hurt my people, Israel. When they ought to know I'm only using them to chastise them. But they're going to rise up in order for me to take them and drag them through the river like a wicked carcass of which I'm going to have to do. And it goes to show you once again that God is sovereign and man is totally depraved and bent on his own evil. And that unless God does something for you and I by virtue of intervention, the whole human race rebels against God like that because their wills are not free. Their wills are slaves to sin. Does that make some sense? All right, I'll leave that one there. I'll just. Um, um, all right, I'm going to actually let me see. I'll do one more thing. Go to Romans chapter seven and let's reassert.
for ourselves what Paul says is the inexorable struggle that all of us have. We're going to start at verse 14. We'll pick this one up on Friday as much more of a personal critical analysis of our own struggle, even as children of grace. <clears throat> Here's what Paul says. For we know that the law is what? Spiritual. Now that takes some explaining, but largely what that means is it actually, the law of God proceeds from God. God is spirit by nature. So the quality of the proposition is spiritual and its aim is at the nature of man. And therefore, the nature of man is to receive God's law at a spiritual level. It's from spirit to spirit. This is critically important. It's spiritual by nature, meaning that it's not merely to be obeyed in the externality of physical activity, but from the what? From the heart. That's what Paul is saying. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? So there's your paradox, paradoxical nature. Now he's talking about himself. He's a believer. Is he carnal? Is there a carnality element to the believer? Right. This is why I said we're simultaneously what? Righteous and what? Right. So we have that conflict, don't we? So this is where Paul is going to explain that within the economy of our sanctification, we have to negotiate with the limitations of our carnal nature that seek to impede our obedience to God. Right. Otherwise, we're going to be lying. Now, watch this. I am carnal and I'm sold under sin. What is sold under, under sin? My body. This body is sold under sin. Do y'all know that? That's the last verse in uh, Romans 7. Start at verse 24. So that this is how we cap out this. He says in verse 24, these words, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the what? Body of, body of this death. That's the carnal part of us, right? The body of this death. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's Romans 7, 14. I am carnal, sold under sin. What is my body? What is it? A body of what? Death, death because of sin. Right. So it's not alive in the sense of spiritual quickening. My soul is. My body is not. My mind is. But my body is not. Now I am able to articulate the formulation of Galatians chapter five, verse 15 and 16. Right. The spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit so that you cannot naturally do what you want to do anymore. You are in a battle. You would agree with that, right? All right, going back to Romans 7 briefly, going back to Romans 7 briefly, Romans 7, now we want to look at in our outline, we can just take up verse, um, start at verse 18. Verse 18, Romans 7, verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my what? That's that, that's that carnal man that is that old wretched man, right? I know that in my... That is in my flesh dwelleth what? For to will is present with me. A desire to do the right thing is with me. But how to perform that which is good, I do not find. Do you see that? Now, what is Paul admitting here? He's admitting a principle of volitional willingness. But he's also admitting an absence of power to do it. Did y'all get that? Right. Before you were saved, you didn't have this willingness. The willingness only comes with the new nature. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. So what the Christian does not get to do is tell the world just because we're born again, we have all power to do the right thing anytime we want to. That would be a lie. Now, the unbeliever doesn't even have the willingness because they're still dead in trespasses and sins. Am I making some sense? So some of us have the willingness, others of us don't, but none of us have the power in ourselves. And that's because God chooses to make sure that the Christian operates out of God's power, not his own. Does that make some sense? Right. So that you don't lie on God about your ability to obey. Because Christians love to sell religion. 
They will package obedience and make tens of millions of dollars out of it. You follow me? I'll show you how to make a bunch of money. Wake up in the morning, pray these prayers, read these Bible verses, do this, do that, do the other thing. You do this, you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be a child of God on the mountaintop and you're lying. The people of God only obey as God gives us grace to obey. So here's what Paul does. He says in verse 19, these words for the good that I would, I do not do, but the evil, which I would not do that I do. Do you see what he's saying? Now, the language is is a lot more technical in the Greek grammar because it's really talking about an awareness of what is right that I long for over against an awareness of what is wrong that I am inclined to want to do. That's a tension. An awareness of what is right that I long for over against an awareness of what is wrong that I am inclined to do. And all Paul is saying is that's where my struggle is. Does that make some sense? All right. Verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. If I actually find myself leaning into and then acting out, expressing the thing that is not right. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So now what Paul is doing is recognizing that in his spiritual man, he longs and knows what's right. Even though from time to time, he actually does what's wrong. You got that? Right. I know this is humbling, but it's true. This is humbling, but it's true. This is not the absolute constant pathology of the believer where every second of the day you're doing the wrong thing. But you do enough of the wrong thing to know it's wrong. And you know it. And, and, and that conflict is there for you to tell the truth about it. I did the wrong thing again. I did the wrong thing again. That was not right to do. And yet I did it anyway. Now, Paul here is talking about discovering how to manage that kind of internal conflict and misorientation of behavior. So he's not just laying out what a Christian goes through in the uh, paralysis of wanting to do what's right, but not being able to do what's right. He's not saying that at all. He's saying you have to learn how to manage the sinfulness of your fallen nature so that your obedience to God is dominated by a set of principles that allows you to overcome those tendencies. That's where Romans 8 comes in to play. But he's walking it out for us to keep us honest. Notice what he says in verse 21. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Do you, do you guys know that one? That's like a remarkable axiomatic reality. Now, I, deny, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. What a wonderful oasis. Does anybody know the oasis? I call this the oasis. I delight in the law of God in my inward. That's, that's the way I opened up Sunday's message. This place that you get to go in the spirit in fellowship with God. That's rich, deep and 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 transformative, quite frankly. It's the place that you want to always be. Yeah, this is what Peter meant when he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I don't even want to go. Let us build a booth for you, Moses, and a lot, and just stay right here. I don't want to go down off the mountaintop. I don't even want to leave. Let's just do church and call it a wrap. Peter was ready to go. He knew he had some growing to do, and he'd rather not. He'd rather just sit there in fellowship. Y'all understand what I'm saying? This is what the child of God loves. It's called the oasis. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Crazy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So right there, what we're admitting is our wills are not free until God gives us grace to liberate our wills from our sinful drives and passions and strengthens us to overcome the inclination to act out on our passion. Did that come home? Like, it's really important for you to know that because 
if you don't have that mechanism working, you will only simply act out of your sin. Right. So so Paul is driving us in a direction. Verse 24. What a great expression. Oh, wretched man that I am. See it? Because so what he's doing is militating against himself. Because he actually understands his identity in Christ over against his identity in Adam. And he's able to actually express in very rhetorical and um, and emotionally charged terms. This actually gives you an insight into the quality of Paul's thinking about what it means to be the righteousness of God in Christ. Because what it indicates is that he hates his old man. Do you see it? How wretched he is to think that he can actually occupy the space of God in a way and just openly rebel against him. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? So inherent in that question is, I need deliverance. That's the whole study of the book of Judges. Do you understand the whole book of Judges is that? We get ready to deal with a brother tripping on that this Sunday. Gideon. He getting ready. Gideon. Here we go. Your turn, Gideon. Your turn, brother. And Gideon's an already acquiesced. Because he didn't look around and don't see nobody doing anything right. And, uh, and you and I are just like Gideon too. And so the answer is given to us in Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So here's what, here's what you know. we picked this up on Friday. We'll pick it up. So if we say to the unbeliever, to the unregenerate person, that in their volition, in their, in their will, they're free to do good or evil, Jesus means nothing. He has no purpose for anybody's life. Do you understand that? Jesus, if you and I can just do good or evil, whatever we want to, then we don't need Jesus. I'm talking about as an unsaved person. They don't need to be saved. They don't need to be converted. They don't need to be born again. All they need to do is just start. Change your ways, boy. Change your ways. Stop now. Just stop acting up now. Go ahead on now. Change your way. Take your leopard skin off. Take your spots off and change your way. Just act right. Haven't y'all heard that before? You just need to change your ways. Now, you ain't going to change your ways. God going to have to change your ways. You do understand that. This is what we teach. Right. So now know what's happening in Romans 8, 3. Paul is saying another power outside of himself has intervened to liberate him from that set of mechanisms in Romans 7. Y'all see that? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Hath made me free. Passive, uh, passive uh, Aries verb form. Hath made me free. I did not make myself free. Christ came and freed me. Do you see it? Have made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 6, 22. This is this gets treated by Paul in Romans 6, 22. And I want you to see it. Romans 6, 22. <clears throat> this is what he says. And then I'm going to read through 24. Um, really start at verse 20, please. Because this is probably where I want it to. For when you were the slave of sin, you were free from righteousness. Right. So we've made that plain. Do you know what that means? You had no relationship to righteousness. Righteousness was free from you and you were free from it. Every time you saw righteousness, you crossed the street. Whenever righteousness saw you, it crossed the street. The twain would never meet because you are a slave of sin. That's what the text is saying. You were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things where you are now ashamed? We know that, don't we? For the end of those things is what? Yeah. Right. So we already know that the wages of sin is what? Yeah. So if a man is a slave of sin, he's living a life of death. That's what the text is saying. Now look at verse 22. <clears throat> but now being made free from what? But now being made free. Notice again, this is the passive verb form. But now being made free. You did not free yourself. Somebody else freed you. Now, we already know the answer. We just had it. Romans chapter 8, 3. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Now we hear Jesus back in John chapter 8, 36, right? For whomsoever the son shall set free, 
is free indeed. Now, what the Christian admits is I was in the prison house of sin and Christ came and liberated me. The only reason I'm walking free now is because another had the power and right to take me out of my condition and put me in another condition so that now I'm walking in the freedom that he purchased for me by his grace. Does that make some sense? So therefore, we're not stealing God's glory by saying by my own free will. I reached around and unlocked the prison door, opened up and walked out. What a delusion. All right, so you guys have been taught a little bit more today yes. that the will of man is not free to do whatever he wants to do. All right.